I am here with Steve Hansen of the Hansen Law Office in Southern California. Steve, can you give us a little background about yourself, your practice, and your bicycling? Well, I have been uh, an attorney since 1986, uh, past the California bar, and I have been riding a bike ever since I've been an attorney. And uh, I got into this, you know, quite early, and I have been primarily focused on defending, representing bicycle industry people. So retailers, manufacturers, distributors, people like that. I've also gotten involved in a number of cases with individual cyclists, representing them against government entities. I've been involved in some cases involving, uh, you know, criminal cases against cyclists, uh, stuff like that. That's, that's more rare. It doesn't happen that often. Uh, but primarily, I work within the bicycle industry. So I pretty much know 90% of the people in the bicycle industry, all the, all the large players. I've worked with all of them. Uh, I do a lot of Consumer Product Safety Commission work from the manufacturer side. So in other words, I get involved in recalls and all the safety stuff. Where can I find or where do I know where it's legal to ride my bike? on a road, particularly when my bike is non-traditional. Peopleforbikes.org is actually a pretty nice resource for riders to take a look and see what's going on in their state as far as human-powered bikes and e-bikes. Uh, they do a pretty good job. They are the, the, the horsepower behind a lot of these state laws, roughly 30 states in trying to pass e-bike legislation and get model legislation passed. So they've, they're have they trying to be a user-friendly source in addition to working behind the scenes for the industry. That's where their funding comes from. Uh, to get people out on e-bikes and to get them more widely accepted and you know out there to be usable and so forth. They do a good job with the on-road segment and when it comes to off-road, uh, things get a little bit sketchy because it's not completely clear yet what's really going on off-road. But on-road, they're pretty good. Uh, and if they don't have something on the website, you can always call them and, tr and, and try to get more specific details. What they will not do is they're not going to get involved in individual problems or projects that you've got in your state unless it's something that's going to represent the broader public. So if you've got a state law problem specifically in your state, they probably already know about it, but it wouldn't hurt to bring it up to them directly and see if they can can move something in your state legislature since they already have done that in about 30 states. So, you know, what kind of happens if I'm in a state that has a three-class system and I ride across the border to a state that doesn't? Yeah, and it's really funny because they have an overview of electric bike regulations. Um, looking at it right now, it's got a little map. And everything is green, which means model legislation, except for a couple of states. For example, they've got uh, Oregon in here as an acceptable state. And then they've got problematic states. Um, and they've only got three problematic states. One is Massachusetts. Of course, a lot of riders there. New Mexico not a huge riding population. And then Alaska, again, not a huge riding population. But nonetheless, like you said, you cross state lines on a road, on your bike, and all of a sudden, now you've got a problem. Uh, and I think this is the focus of your you know, your broadcast is, is you know, what, what happens? What do you need to do if you've got a three or four wheeled device that's either human powered or electrically powered or god forbid gasoline powered what do you do then if you get pulled over or stopped yeah i mean that's where we're going to head to because you know, a lot of even in some of these states that have the people for bikes have said it's got reasonable legislation a lot of them don't define uh human powered vehicles they they define bicycles as something you know that's other than human powered uh, and, and so you've get something like a hand cycle or another adaptive cycle or something like that out there on yeah. the road. What, what, what does that mean? You know, if I'm, if like, you know, I use Texas as an example, cause we're some of the worst, it defines bicycles as a device that has two tandem wheels of 20 inches or larger. 
there's a lot of things out there on the road that we're pedaling or cranking that are not two tandem wheels. It's sort of like legislation by omission. So if you have a device that's not covered, it's not discussed in, you know, in the law, then what? What are you? What, you know, what governs your usage on the road? This is where you really run into trouble with, you know, police, because police only know certain amounts of the vehicle code in the state. And if they run into something that they don't know, they always have to run back to these, these you know, fallback provisions that are sort of like, well, you're operating something that isn't legit. You're operating something that isn't defined. Uh, you're violating this code section. Uh, so therefore I'm going to just write you under this code section because I don't know, you know, I can't really be sure what it is that you're using or writing. Uh, and, and that's when things start getting messy because like I said, the police don't know the fine points of the law. They just know the broad strokes and they'll cite you for, you know, unsafe speed or, you know, we have a, a basic speed law in California. So if they don't know what they can do, they could just write you for an unsafe speed and say, well, yeah, but I was only going 20. Well, that's an unsafe speed under the conditions or based on what you were using or something like that. So they'll throw these things out and it's like, well, that's not even a legit, you know, citation. So, but now you have a citation and now you have to fight it. And that's when things get tricky. You know, the absurdity of this on these wheel definitions is, uh, and four wheels comes up a lot in our ecosystem because uh, a lot of quadricycles out there are a lot of uh, cargo cycles and some adaptive cycles are four wheels because of either balance or load issues. Whether or not a bicycle of tandem wheel, you know, training wheels is a two wheeled or four wheel vehicle. And because that's the, that's the absurdity of this. And the, the, the claim is that it's not that the training wheels are make it a four wheel vehicle. You get into a really specific issue like this and it's going to take, first of all, if someone were to be, so you have two issues. One is general question. Can I use this training wheel bicycle out on the road, you know, or on the sidewalk or something like that? So that's sort of the general question. You'd have to research that in your specific state, your specific city, your specific county. It, the, the other side of that is, okay, now I got cited by the police for a violation of X statute. Okay, so then you'd have to go back and, and look at that statute that you were cited for and then try to fight that you know particular. So it's a, there's two ways to look at it. One is the citation for a specific violation of a specific law. The other is the more general question, is this, quote unquote, legal to do? on this particular roadway, sidewalk, trail, whatever. So all you can do is go on the existing statutes and say, well, this is what they say. And it doesn't really talk about a training wheel. It does talk about four wheel. And then you come down to statutory construction and all the craziness that that involves. Uh, some, you know, a judge, somebody would eventually have to get involved in a situation and say, well, I don't think you violated this. I, you know, that sort of a thing. So it's, very, very tricky stuff. And this is why w when you're trying to create a, a state law, for example, when BPSA or People for Bikes came in and said, let's create this state, you know, let's create this, this state law involving e-bikes, they were really only concerned with creating an e-bike situation that was going to be safe for class one, two, or three. And if you read... <laughs> If you read the model legislation and some of the stuff behind what BPSA was doing, they basically came right out and said, if you've got a device, if you're a manufacturer and you've got a device and you don't conform to this 20 mile an hour, 750 watt, one horsepower situation, if you don't conform to it, we're not going to help you. We're not going to back you. We're not going to help you. You're on your own. If you don't fit within this, you don't fit, it's your problem. It, you know, and so if you're a purchaser of one of those devices, 
you're also on your own. Uh, if, if you're in a class state, a three class state, and you've got a, a, a motor that's outside of that, it's plated at 1000 watts, for example, um, you know, and the three class system, 750 watt limits, you know, what are they, what would happen? What, how do they know that this thing is there? Um, you know, what, what would occur if I got yeah. stopped or if I was in an ac- a, a vehicular accident? The three class law was based, was created, grew out of, you know, a three line definition created in, oh God, I think it was 2003. Yes. 2003 is when they changed the definition of bicycle at, at the consumer, consumer product safety commission. And they said, Okay, bicycle now means a two or three wheeled vehicle with fully operable pedals and an electric motor of less than 750 watts per ends, one horsepower, whose maximum speed on a paved level surface when powered solely by such motor when ridden by an operator who weighs 170 pounds is less than 20. So they they sort of tried to define what 750 watts was with, quote unquote, one horsepower, and then they tried to define what it could do, how much it could push on level ground. Most of the state laws, including California, try to require the manufacturers to label the bike so that it says 750 watts, you know, 20 miles an hour. There's a specific requirement for a labeling. Okay, then you get into the situations where, yes, you have this labeling. It's a class one, two, or three. It's got 750 watts. Now someone has done something. Someone has tweaked something. So now it technically can go over 20. Now it technically has more than one horsepower, 750 watts. What do you do then? Well, the Europeans are on this. They already know that modification is happening. California state law, for example, prohibits modification unless you re-sticker. And if you, if you create something out of the three classes, you're out. You now have a bike that doesn't comply with California state vehicle code for usage on the roads. And if something were involved in an accident and somebody says, Hey, I think this bike was going 40 miles an hour when it ran into this pedestrian, you would be involved in some sort of a forensic situation where they'd have to say, okay, what is this motor doing? Is it a 750 watt motor? Is it a one horsepower motor? Can it propel someone more than 20 miles an hour? Wouldn't be too hard to figure that out. If, like you said, you get someone that's got a lab, someone that can test something, you know, great. I've asked, unfortunately, I asked about the 750 watts, what that means. Other than the one horsepower, which again doesn't help too much, uh, it's not clear what 750 watt means. If that was peak, if that was average, it wasn't clear when CPC wrote the law, what they meant as a result, BPSA, People for Bikes, when they wrote their three classes and the state legislation was written, everybody just kept saying 750 watts or one horsepower, and they didn't specify how to measure 750 watts. So it's sort of a sore subject that no one wants to really talk about. Um <laughs> You know, and that's what happens when you model your state legislation after a federal law that's three lines long. What is an insurance policy going to do, right? So the question with the insurance policy is now you have injured somebody riding an e-bike and the, the someone's suing you because you injured them. Now the question for the insurance company is, are we going to cover this claim or not? And then it comes down to what does the policy say? Is this was this thing that he was riding? Is this a thing that we can insure? Is it covered within our policy? Well, we cover anything that's covered by state law, or who knows what the policy says. Then the question becomes, like you said, it, you know, was it illegally modified by a bike shop or a user? And then if it was. You know, now now there's a new problem. If the bike shop did it, now they've got a liability problem. If the user did it, maybe they have a liability problem. Maybe they don't have insurance coverage now for the accident, which 
actually is a big problem really for the person that's suing because now there's no insurance covering the suit. So that's a that's just a whole it's just a can of worms there. You know, and just because let's say you have a bike that you buy at a bike shop and it meets class one, two, and three, and it's got all its, you know, it's 100% legit under state law. It's a totally legit bike, a e bike, and you injure someone. Okay. Th- that doesn't necessarily mean that it's covered by your insurance policy. That's, that's, don't think that. Uh, even if you have, I mean, even if you have a bicycle, and you're riding a human powered bicycle and you run into someone and they sue you, you know, don't make assumptions about what your insurance policy is going to cover or, you know, which insurance policy might cover you. Is it going to be an automobile policy that you have, a renter's policy, a homeowner's insurance policy? You know, don't just don't make assumptions about insurance because that's a whole other issue. And there are companies that are now trying to sell, quote unquote, you know, e-bike insurance. Okay. And the idea is that they're saying, well, we can we can sell you this policy that's going to cover theft and it's going to cover this and it's going to cover that and it's going to cover liability and it's going to, okay. And you're going to, it's a separate policy. Okay. That's great. Uh but again, there's probably going to be parameters in that policy of things that it's not going to cover. And I would assume one of the things it's not going to cover is something, for example, that wouldn't be legally usable on a state road or something that was being used in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or, you know, I mean, he'd have to read the policy. But when you go back and look at what the federal law says about recumbent bicycles, for example, and this is a thing that traps people all the time. It talks about a bicycle. It first defines a bicycle as a two-wheeled vehicle that's human-powered. Then it says the two- or three-wheeled vehicle with fully operable pedals and the electric motor. Okay, that's now a bicycle. Okay, but then if you go down and look at recumbent, recumbent says a recumbent bicycle means a bicycle in which the rider okay so so the problem is recumbent now means it's either a two or a three wheeled bicycle but it's got to be three wheeled electric and then it's recumbent so you don't so for example a four wheeled if you have a four wheeled recumbent device <laughs> it's not covered under the CPSC law and if you have a three wheeled human powered device it's not covered under the cpsc law so now you've got a huge gap right there in what the federal law says retailers can even sell that's regulated let's say you have a four-wheeled recumbent that's not covered by the consumer product safety commission under its law okay that doesn't mean that Texas law can't regulate how such non-CPSC regulated devices use. So maybe Texas law would say, okay, a four-wheeled human-powered device uh, can be used on roads. Okay, that's fine. It's just the CPSC doesn't regulate it or talk about it, but, but Texas says you can use that unregulated thing on our road. The problem with the law enforcement situation is they're probably not going to pull you. I don't know about Texas, but they're probably not going to pull you over in California unless you're doing something to draw attention to yourself, like you are stopping traffic, like you are doing something dangerous. You know, you're going to draw attention to yourself. So if you're drawing attention to yourself and then you get pulled over and then you become a problem then they're going to want to cite you for something probably because you're a problem. And this this also comes up in the situation with, well, what do they do with my bike kind of a thing? Well, <laughs> this became a problem in California a couple of years ago where they were arresting people, citing people for drunk driving or driving unsafely, not having a driver's license, whatever. And then they would impound their cars and put them in Im- impound lots 30 miles away at a cost of $300 a day. And then after three days, the person that was basically driving to Taco Bell 
can no longer afford to get their car. I mean, the same thing can happen with a bike. If you get arrested or you get cited, there's always a question of, are they going to continue to allow you to ride the bike, you know, in violation, or are they going to impound it? And then if they impound it, obviously you have no way to get around. So they'd have to drive you somewhere. Then they'd have to take the bike, you know, put it in the trunk, do something with it, back of SUV, and then impound it at, at your cost. So, you know, that becomes another, another problem. And this all goes back to how much of a problem were you on the device and how much of a problem did you, you know, make for the officer? I mean, if you're someone that's disabled in some way using a quadricycle, uh, I can't imagine it would be great press to be <laughs> impounding that bike, but you know, as you know, strange things happen. They understand what cars do and they understand where cars drive. And if they think, uh oh, look at this guy doing this, this guy looks like he could be run over by a car. So we better stop him and help him out, do him a favor and do the cars a favor too. That's usually what they're trying to do. They're usually trying to say, look, we're trying to help you, we're trying to protect you, we're trying to save you from cars. So, you know, and that's usually, and, and maybe the way to do that is to cite you to make you stop riding where the cars are. Because again, the cars is what they're primarily concerned about. They're not concerned really about the bike riders and the human powered vehicle, ride. They're not really concerned about those people. They're concerned about the cars. They don't want the cars to hit those people. And they also don't want the cars to be slowed down and, and they don't want the cars to run into problems and all this sort of thing. So that. They're just concerned about traffic flow. A lot of jurisdictions and places have come up with these no motorized trails, no motors on the trail or no motorized vehicles on trails. If I'm on one of those and I've got an e-bike and I turn it off, am I still, I mean, it's very hypothetical. I know that, but am I still in, am I still got a motor vehicle or am I just pedaling at that point? Yeah, I was, you know, California, <laughs> I was I was looking at the California law with respect to e-bikes, um, and it 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 says, for example, here we're talking about because the California law sort of created an exception for state universities, for example. It also created an exception for off-road, so county off-road, city off-road, state off-road, federal off-road. It basically said those areas get to do what they want but the state law for let's just take a look at at uh bike paths class one bike paths in california which is usually county operated jurisdictionally um it it says here no class three electric bike uh shall be operated on a bicycle path or trail. So here they tried to eliminate class three bikes. You can use class one and class two, but not class three. So, so one would say, well, wait a minute. This is an example of what I'm, uh, what I'm telling you about. So it says the class three bicycles shall not be operated on a bicycle path. Okay, well, what does it mean to operate a class three bicycle. Does that mean to operate it by pedaling it or does that mean to engage the motor in some way? Well, here's the problem with a class three bicycle. If you're using it and if it's a correct class three, the motor can only engage when you pedal. It doesn't have a throttle. Okay. So is it possible, like you said, to take the battery out or turn the motor off in some way so that the motor doesn't engage at all on the class three when you pedal it. Yeah, it's possible to do that. Okay. Then what would you be able to, you know, what would your defense be? Your defense would be, well, I wasn't operating a class three bike because the, the battery was removed or the battery was off or whatever. So therefore it was a human powered bike. I don't know where that would come out, right? Because it says operated and it's a class three bike. You're operating it by pedaling it, even though you're not using the motor, you're not utilizing the motor. One of the things that I see, 
and this is this is how the law gets changed. I mean, one of the things that I see on class one bikeways where only bikes can go, there's no cars or not next to a road. So in other words, or along a river or something like that in California. I see a lot of electrically powered and gasoline powered devices that are going way over 20 miles an hour. No pedaling is involved. They're just some sort of a throttle device. They're clearly not supposed to be used on that path. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any enforcement going on yet. So now we'll have to wait for an accident to happen. And I've known of two or three where, you know, electrically powered device operators have run into other cyclists and have left the scene. You know, and so that's going to create a situation where there's either going to have to be a stepped up enforcement or something else is going to happen with the state law. What happens when I'm in an accident? What, what do I need to do? If you're concerned about some sort of a civil action that you would file against somebody or someone would file against you or both, uh, the first thing you need to do, of course, is preserve as much of the scene as you can. So usually people ride with smartphones. I would just take a 360 degree video of everything, the, the circumstances, you know, photos, whatever, document as much as you can, skid marks, pieces of bike, where the point of impact was on the, on the roadway or trail, that sort of a thing. Gather as much as you can that way. The next thing is to try to find out who the witnesses are. And, you know, if necessary, videotape the witness telling you what happened and then try to get that person's name and phone number uh, so that you can get back to them. But having a statement, you know, a video of someone saying, you know, this guy did this and this guy did this, uh, that's invaluable. Most of the bike riders that I know, they're also using um, – <laughs> they're using cameras front and back on their bike that are, you know, recording everything that goes on. Uh, they're pretty sophisticated. I think it's great. I, I often chuckle at this stuff because I think to myself and people do use them in cars. My, my police friend that I was telling you about, he's got front and rear ca uh, cameras in his car all the time. Cause he's, you know, worried about something. And I laugh because I said, well, you know, <laughs> That stuff can be used against you. Uh, <laughs> your own cameras can be used against you to show that you were at fault. And so gathering the evidence and then and then seeing if you can document it with a you know with a police report, police reports are difficult because sometimes if there's not an injury or not something major or it's not on a roadway of some sort, you can't get police to show up. Uh, they don't want to. They're just like, you know, call it in kind of a thing. So that that doesn't become very useful. So you're sort of on your own at that point, gathering all the data points and the statements and then turning it into insurance. You know, they're going to ask for a police report. Well, there isn't one. This is what I've got. Statements and recorded video and that sort of thing. Turn it over to them and and let them know, you know, what's happening. If it's on a roadway, you know, you've also got usually state law requirements as to turning in, especially if there's some some sort of an injury, you've got a requirement to 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 turn in specific, you know, California state forms that an injury has occurred, uh, especially if a vehicle is involved, uh, not necessarily a bicycle, but a vehicle. So uh, document, 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 document is all I can say. Gather as much information as you can and preserve it and make sure that you've got witnesses and then go from there and and don't rely on the police to come up with a conclusion as to what happened because 50 percent of the time they end up being wrong so watch out yep. well steve i appreciate the time you've given us today and uh look forward to working with you on a lot of this stuff in the future thank you